This podcast is on interpreting regression output. So this podcast will look a little different from our other podcasts. I'm going to focus on helping you to complete your research project in terms of getting the right information into your report. And we're going to look at the template project and I have in front of me uh, two copies of that project. Uh, the one on the left hand side uh, will focus mainly on the text of the research report and the one on the right is going to focus on the regression output that you're going to generate from the commands that I have sent to you in a previous module. And this uh, output is in the appendix part of the template project. So I'm going to make reference to uh, both the appendix, and this is on the right hand side where my cursor is uh, circa circling, and on the left hand side is the part where you're inserting information in the report. And I apologize if the text is a little bit small, but I'm going to talk us through it and I'll show you with my cursor on which parts of the page you should be focusing on. So, uh, we're going to focus on, first of all, getting this table uh, correct uh, for the results of the multiple regression estimation. And this is on page 6 of the template project, and it'll be your page 6 as well. We're going to start with the R, the Pearson correlation, and the significance of uh, the correlation. So, I've asked you in the uh, commands to enter your variables, dependent variable first, and then your independent variables. Some of you will have two independent variables, others of you will have three independent variables. In the template project, we have three independent variables, and uh, they are, if you've read through the report, you know that they're abbreviated as uh, Christ Ad, uh, which is an abbreviation for the percentage of population for Christian adherence, that's one independent variable. College, uh, percentage of the population that is a college graduate. And then South, which is a dummy variable for whether or not the U.S. state is uh, in the South. So those are independent variables. Uh, and um, the dependent variable is the percent of state legislat uh, legislatures uh, who are women. Uh, so that is the dependent variable. Um, the correlations will come from this correlation matrix, and you've read these matrices before, so I don't think I'm going to be presenting new information here. But the first correlation we'll look at is negative 0.57. That is the correlation between Christian adherence and percentage of state legislators who are women. <coughs> Excuse me. So that will go, that negative 0.57, will go in the row for a Christian adherent variable under the column headed by R. And then 0 0.410, which is the correlation between percent population college graduates and state legislators who are female, that goes in this cell right here associated with the variable college. And then negative point, uh, 627, that uh, goes with the um, South dummy variable and percentage of state legislators for women, and that goes in the cell right here uh, for the South row uh, independent variable. Uh, the significance of these correlations will also be reported in the R sig column, point zero 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 for percentage of population or Christian adherence right there. 0 0.003, percentage of population college graduates, and 0 0.000, the South dummy variable. So that's all that you need to do for the correlation matrix. Okay? Uh, and we can move on uh, to look at uh, the multiple regression analysis itself. And that is contained in, uh, especially in this information here on the right-hand side, model summary, uh, ANOVA, and coefficients. So for the model summary, uh, let's look at uh, R for, uh, for a moment, and that is the uh, 0.791, 
which is simply the correlation of the predicted value for the dependent variable from the regression analysis uh, to the actual uh, value of the dependent variable. So 0.791 is a pretty high correlation, which means that this is a model that's explaining uh, a lot of the dependent variable. We know that the R-squared, 0.626, and the adjusted R-squared, 0.602, also indicate that this is a strong model. Uh, the uh, percentage of variation in the dependent variable, percentage of state legislators who are women, uh, is uh, uh, explained, 62.6% .6 of that variation is explained by the three independent variables. The F-test is a test to see if the independent variables jointly explain variation in the dependent variable, and clearly they do. The F is very high, 25.678, and the SIG for the F is 0 0.000, and so the, the model itself is statistically significant. Then in this box here, the last piece of information that you report of will be the uh, constant or the y-intercept, and that is 29.044, and uh, the p-value, which is the same thing as the significance, uh, we will report that as well, 0 .000. Uh, so that's where you get that information from, uh, this part of the output. So that's the regression part of the output. Um, We'll move up then uh, and look at where we put the information for our independent variables. B is the slope coefficient, and the slope coefficient uh, is uh, for Christian adherence right here, negative 0.270. So that gets reported right here. The percentage of population college graduates, 0.359. That one gets reported right there. And then the South Dummy variable, negative 7.841, uh, and that gets reported from here all the way up to there. So uh, those are our slope coefficients. Um, then there's something called standardized slope coefficients, and that's talked about a little bit uh, in the Lewis Beck and Lewis Beck monograph. Uh, and this is a, uh, an indication of the relative importance of the independent variables explaining variation in the dependent variable. The farther away the beta is from zero, because they are both positive and negative numbers, uh, the more important that independent variable is in explaining variation in the dependent variable. The closer the beta is to the uh, number zero, the less important it is. So uh, if we take this beta uh, standardized coefficient, negative 0.441, and we put it for Christian adherence in this cell here. And then 0.198 percentage of population college graduates, we put that right there. And then negative 0.468 we, for the South Dummy, we put that right there. So if we were to rank order the slope coefficients in terms of overall importance, uh, the South Dummy variable is the most important because it is farthest away from zero. The Christian adherence is uh, next important, and uh, then clearly coming up the rear is the college variable is the least important. Um, the p-value is equivalent to the significance level, so the sig uh, will be uh, uh, reported, and you can see that uh, that's the y-intercept sig. I shouldn't be circling that. The Christian adherence sig is 0 .000, and that gets reported right here. College adherence, negative 0.043, that gets reported right here. And the South dummy variable, 0 0.000, again gets reported for the South dummy variable row under the column heading of p-value. T-statistics, um, they are, of course, of the same sign as the slope coefficient, negative 0.46, negative 4.766 for the percentage of population Christian adherence gets reported there. Uh, 2.076, that gets reported uh, for college, it gets reported in that cell. And then negative 4.835 for the South Dummy variable, that gets reported uh, in this cell here. And finally, uh, the variance inflation factors. Uh, we go down, uh, sometimes 
the SPSS output um, goes into another page. But this is all, again, uh, part of the multiple regression analysis. And if you follow those commands, you will get the VIFs. The uh, VIFs are thus reported. Uh, 1.055 for Christian adherence goes there. 1.122 percentage of population college graduates gets reported in this cell here. And then 1.154 for the South W variable gets reported in the final cell that we have to cover, and that is the VIF for the South W variable. All the language that you see below this table, you can just copy and paste into your research report. Uh, there's no issue of plagiarism. This is just simply defining the information that you are reporting. So you do not need to worry about that at all. Uh, just go ahead and, and do a direct uh, uh, copy and paste, if you like, uh, into your report. So we're going to move on. And now the discussion of the results, and I'm actually going to kind of reverse things here. I'm going to go back to the, on this uh, version of the project, I'm going to go back to the table so that we can refer to the right parts while we're uh, discussing the discussion of, uh, of results. Um, so for the, and in fact, you can use very similar language in your report uh, that is used in this template report. Um, the, this is all very boilerplate language. Um, it uh, is uh, correct to use this language because it reflects the interpretation of uh, your, uh, your output. Of course, your numbers are going to be different. Not all of your independent variables are going to be statistically significant. Your R squared score will probably vary. It might not be very high. Um, so you'll have to talk about that. If your R squared is low, don't say it's high, uh, say it's low. Uh, but you can use language that's very similar uh, to the, that in the template project. So assuming no uh, change in the independent variable, women would hold 29.044% the constant of the seats in state legislatures. So that comes directly from the um, by intercept that you report uh, in your table, okay? uh, and uh, the R of 0.791 comes directly from, again, the report in the table, and you can talk about how high the correlation is between the actual and predicted values of the dependent variable. The R squared of 0.626 and uh, the adjusted R squared of 0.602, again, those come from the table that you have just created, and you can use very similar language that is used in the template report. So you can note that uh, there's very little loss, uh, in, at least in this report, there's very little loss uh, in variance explained based upon the number of independent variables. So that is, uh, um, that's, that's very good. The uh, F statistic uh, also indicates that they taken together the independent variables explain variation significantly in the dependent variable. So that's where that discussion comes from. Um, you'll take each independent variable uh, individually, and we will talk first of all about the correlation. So you can talk about strong negative correlation, and that comes from this part of the table here, the R of negative 0.57 for Christian adherence, strong negative correlation. The T, the R sig, um, um, which is the p-value is 0 0.000, also supporting statistical significance. You can interpret the unstandardized slope coefficient, which is the uh, b right here. That's the unstandardized slope coefficient. Uh, report what that means in terms of a one-point change in Christian adherence. That means that uh, the percentage of females in the legislature uh, changes by negative 0.27. Um, you can also discuss what the uh, uh, t-statistic tells us, uh, t-value, t-ratio, they all mean the same thing, so you can use whatever language you wish. Uh, negative 0.4766 uh, indicates statistical significance. Um, and the beta, or standardized slope coefficient, of negative 0.441 uh, means that it is the middle of the three independent variables in terms of importance in explaining variation in the dependent variable. And with a VIF of uh, negative, uh, VIF of 1.0055, 1 
1.005, sorry about that. Um, that's far from the crucial VIF of five for multicollinearity. So there, there does not appear to be strong uh, multicollinearity, at least with this independent variable. And so you do this for the other two independent variables as well. You uh, go to the table and again, find the information that you need to report for college graduates and for the South dummy variable. Okay, so that's this page here. There's a lot of verbiage, but um, again, you can, you can use a lot of this language in your uh, report as well. Again, this is not, it's not an issue of plagiarism. It is more about uh, correctly representing what it is that you are seeing in your analysis uh, and, uh, and, and writing about that in a correct fashion. So I don't mind seeing very similar language to um, the one in the template report and your individual project. Okay, now we're going to go talk, now we're going to talk about the regression assumptions. So I'm going to go to different pages in the appendix to talk about those assumptions. So we're going to start with autocorrelation. This one's really easy. No one is using time series data, so you can just copy and paste this sentence into your report. Your model, your model is not using time series data, so you're not going to worry about autocorrelation. Remember that autocorrelation is a problem when you have time series data. So you're using cross-sectional data. You do not need to worry about autocorrelation. Okay, we do need to worry about uh, whether or not we have uh, a homoscedasticity. So um, in this model here, there's no heteroscedasticity, which means there is, which all, all the variables are homoscedastic. Um, to find these graphs, uh, you'll also put this in your report as to what page you're looking at. So we're going to go to page 19. Okay. And on page 19, you'll find a scatter plot. Um, and in your report, you're going to find a, uh, your, your output, you're going to find a scatter plot with unstandardized predicted values on the x axis and studentized residuals on the y-axis. So um, this is the predicted value from the regression model for your dependent variable. And these are the errors in prediction for uh, that dependent variable. So what we want to see is we want to see a pattern very much like this, where the points are going across the page from left to right, you know, obvious pattern, okay? And I've shown you before in a previous uh, a podcast that when you see points that are kind of shooting off in the direction of my cursor from bottom left to top right, or top left to bottom right, or they kind of go in a funnel uh, where they are uh, kind of have wide variation at the left hand side and then there's no variation at all on the right hand side, that's an indication that you have, um, uh, you have heteroscedasticity. That means you have non-constant error variance. Uh, here, uh, this, this looks like homoscedasticity, where there's constant error variance and you do not have uh, an issue with that. So we need to look at the correct graphs. We need to go to page 19. This is page 19. This is the graph for the Christian adherent independent variable. Um, the one for the second independent variable, we'll go to page 28. When we look at this one as well, and again, uh, there really isn't any particular pattern. Well, there's less variation, there's kind of a little constriction there, but it's still, um, uh, that looks very much uh, like a almost a, a schedastic graph. And then when we go to page 38, and this is interesting to look at, so for a dummy variable, you're only gonna have two values. Um, Right, either a zero or a one, so there are only going to be two unstandardized predicted values. So in this instance, we, we look at, you'll notice that there's kind of a darker shading in this line uh, over here on the far right, and a darker shading here. That just so, shows concentration of points. So the darker shading means that there are a lot of points that are in this particular interval here. And we want to see that uh, because that also means relatively constant variance. Um, 
And uh, that, that also is an indication of homoscedasticity. So that's actually good if you're using a dummy variable or a categorical variable. Some of you are using survey research uh, uh, variables where you have maybe three or four categories. You're also going to have these vertical lines um, and you'll need to interpret them. So this one also is an indicator uh, that there is uh, no heteroscedasticity. It's a homoscedastic um, uh, relationship between the independent variable of the South dummy and the percentage of females in legislature. Okay, so that's all for uh, the homoscedasticity. For linearity, let's go to page 21. So, so uh, putting your page numbers in is pretty important. So for page 21, um, we look at the, uh, the graphs. This one looks very linear. Okay. The R squared is not particularly high, but it looks like the points are following a negative uh, linear pattern. And if we look at page 30 for the college independent variable, um, and a lot less linear, but again, we can see there's a general trend upward. You can imagine if we didn't have this line here that you would say that there's a slight upward trend. Now again, with the dummy variable, uh, that line is going to look very strange. Uh, so in fact, that's the very last page. Um, but it reflects that there is a fairly large concentration of points uh, for zero, and then a fairly large concentration of points for one. So it's kind of pulling in a negative direction. So it's hard to in interpret linearity when you have a dummy variable. All right, the multicollinearity discussion. Remember that we already covered that. If we go back to this will take a moment. If we go back to page whoops we go, page twelve, we've already reported our VIFs. Those are the primary things that we're going to use to uh, assess multicollinearity, uh, and they're nowhere near five. Another way you can assess multicollinearity is to look at this correlation matrix. And this part of the correlation matrix is of the independent variables uh, correlated with each other. So right down here, and we can see these are very small correlations, minus 0 0.139, 0 0.215, minus 0 0.322. So those are very small, far from uh, kind of the troubling sign of a, a correlation, a high correlation, which would be um, uh, around 0.8 or negative 0.8. So there's, there's no real indication of multicollinearity. Um, normality assumption. Um, if you have a sample size of at least 30, and all of you do, um, you, don't, you can just simply say that the central limit theorem is in place. Uh, you can all, and, and say that because the central limit theorem is in place, uh, the, uh, um, the, the distribution will be normal. So that's all that you really need to say for that. Um, you can also look at the uh, normality plots. And we have a few of these. Um, the, uh, the first normality plot uh, would be this histogram here. And it shows that uh, there's a fairly wide distribution of the uh, Christian adherent um, uh, variable. Um, so you can use that. Uh, you can also uh, go to the other two histograms. This one also looks pretty normal. This one is for college graduates. And then, of course, the one that's going to look odd is that, um, uh, well, not so odd, I guess, this uh, uh, studentized residual for the um, uh, histogram for the um, South dummy variable. Uh, but uh, the key thing is, again, if you have a sample size of at least 30, the normality assumption is satisfied. Okay, now residual outliers. So the, the, the part here that we're going to use will be, we'll look at these case summaries. Okay. Um, they are reported for each independent variable, one at a time. So if we look at the residual outliers, what we're trying to identify is whether or not there are, I'm sorry, I think I'm on the wrong variable here. I am. Let me go to the top. Okay. It's this. So if we, if we start with Christian adherence, we're looking for studentized residuals that are either 
less than minus 2 or greater than 2. And those are the major outliers. And you can see that there aren't any major outliers. If we look at the studentized residuals, um, they are uh, within that band between minus 2 and plus 2. If we were pushed, we could say that the, uh, the lowest extreme value was Kentucky. So if we look at Kentucky, negative 1.93. Uh, that is uh, the largest negative residual. So Kentucky is kind of overpredicted uh, to have uh, females in their legislature. And in fact, if we see the percentage of state legislators who are female, uh, Kentucky is one of the lowest uh, percentages of all. So um, it is so a negative residual means that the dependent variable is overpredicted for that case. A positive residual means that the dependent variable is underpredicted for that case. So Kentucky has um, an overprediction, and uh, Washington State, I believe, is the underprediction. Yes, and Washington State is a bit of an outlier with having a high percentage of females in the state legislature. So it's uh, so um, you know it's relatively high and relatively low values tend to be less well predicted by regression models. Uh, the college independent variable. Again, we're going to look for these case summaries. And for it, it looks like we have three cases that are beyond that plus and two, plus and minus two range. Uh, Maine uh, is under predicted at uh, 2.02. And then um, Virginia is over predicted. So uh, its uh, percentage of females in the legislature is higher than we would expect based upon the number of college graduates. Uh, then Washington State is also um, underpredicted, and again, it has a very, very high percentage of females in the legislature compared to the other states. So the South dummy variable, go to our final listing here. And um, here in the template report, I accidentally kind of reverse these two columns. Um, so again, we're looking for the studentized residuals. And uh, New Jersey is underpredicted. So um, it should have a higher score than, uh, than in fact, it uh, does if it's underpredicted. Um, Pennsylvania is also underpredicted, and Washington is. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I got that reversed. New Jersey is overpredicted, Pennsylvania is overpredicted, and um, Washington State is underpredicted uh, based upon uh, their South uh, dummy variable status. Okay, so that's what we use in terms of the information from the appendix, from your regression output, uh, to report the um, uh, information correctly uh, in your template project. So that's all I wanted to accomplish for this particular podcast. Uh, feel free to make reference to this uh, uh, frequently. And of course, you can ask me any questions. You can send me your output as well, and I can make sure that you have all of the information that you need in order to um, uh, do the analysis correctly. Uh, I'm, I'm here to help you in any way that I can. Uh, thanks for watching and have a nice day.